This podcast is made possible by the patrons at patreon.com. To become a supporter of the show, visit patreon.com slash Keith Bergun. Hello and welcome to the Clockwork Game Design Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Bergun. Today's show, we're going to do a few different things. First, I'm going to give you just a general update, what's been going on with me, talk about some games I've been playing. Um, I also want to talk about one of the games that I've been playing in particular, which is League of Legends. And that's something that I've written um, articles about before. Uh, I did one video comparing League of Legends to Heroes of the Storm. But I wanted to go in depth and talk about some of the reasons why I think League of Legends is the world's best strategy game that exists right now. Um, And that's not something that I'm happy about. I wish that weren't the case, but I do think it is the case. Um, And I'll talk about why I think that is. And also, finally, I'm going to talk about the challenges that come with being, uh, making video games and being the person who is both designing and uh, coding that game specifically. And I do think this is a relationship that's kind of a special one, the designer coder relationship. And I'm going to talk about some reasons why that is and some of the challenges I've had doing that and maybe some solutions. So the first thing I want to talk about is chess mix. Um, I've submitted uh, chess mix to, I've I've submitted chess mix to Indiecade. I'm really hoping that uh, it's able to uh, make a good impression on somebody there. Um, And uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I do intend to attend Indiecade this year. If anyone wants to uh, come say hi to me, I should be there. I think they've just announced the dates for when Indiecade is. It's in October. And it's in Santa Monica, if I remember correctly. I really recommend Indiecade. I've been to a bunch of different cons. Um, I've been to PAX East. I've been to GDC. I've been to Project Horseshoe. I've been to um, Practice NYU's Practice Game Design and Detail. That's the one I go to the most because it's near me. Um, But I've been to a bunch of different cons. And um, Indiecade is the best in terms of, you know, if you're... Certainly, if you're not um, a straight white guy, I think it's like maybe the most inviting of an atmosphere. It's just a very inclusive atmosphere. And it's sort of um, there's a lot of just um, I think there's like pretty good diversity there. And they try to um, showcase a lot of different kinds of games. And it just I don't know, it just has less of a hostile atmosphere than something like PAX, which to me um, felt a little bit. Uh, like it's just loud, it's corporate, it's like aggressive. And I just feel like there's a lot of like, um, testosterone and, um, at, at some of those cons. And, um, so anyway, I, I recommend Indiecade. I recommend going to all these, um, conventions if you can, if you're a game developer, if you're an indie game developer, I really think it's one of the best things you can do and it's expensive, but, um, it's worth it. Uh, actually, today is the first day of GDC that I'm recording this, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't afford to go that go to that this year. But um, it's out in um, San Francisco, and uh, but I do recommend if you can put the money together uh, to do that. So I did submit Chess Mix to Indiecade, and uh, I'm hoping that that uh, gets selected uh, to be shown there. That'd be great. And uh, Chess Mix has been coming along quite nicely, um, smoothly. Um, I do have some plans for it. Like, I have a general idea of where it's going to go. Although this is going to tie into the second segment of this show about some of the, the challenges of being a designer and a programmer on a project. And this is something that I think Omnocronom really suffered from. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um Another little update is I'm sort of revamping my Patreon a little bit. I'm just kind of trying to, um, I want to do a few different things with the Patreon. I'll talk about that more, um, coming up soon. Uh, I'll probably write an article about that in the future. That's another thing is I'm, I'm going to be refocusing a little bit more on articles going forward. Um, I've just, I've been thinking a lot about like what formats are best for the kind of work that I do. And I'm really intrigued by the idea of doing videos. You know, I started a new season of uh, three minute game design and I do think that videos kind of have the highest maybe cap for, um, you know, how much interest you can garner with, um, with this kind of stuff. I think videos have the highest, uh, potential for that. 
On the other hand, I think that videos are probably the least good um, for the kinds of stuff that I want to talk about and explain. I feel like articles, you know, where you can sit there and go at your own pace and... I mean, technically, you can go at your own pace with art with videos too, but um, I I don't know. I, I feel like articles, and then, then the other factor is just videos take so much time. If you're going to make some of the production values on YouTube and what is expected um, is a lot higher these days, and um, than it was when I did my first season of uh, three minute game design. Um, and I can certainly, you know, I, I intend to get do another at least. Four five to eight episodes on this season uh but it's it's so much work and it just sometimes it feels like as i'm going through i'm writing all the rest of the episodes and sometimes it just feels like it it's just not the best format for what i'm doing and also you know another thing that is a factor is like you know i put out a couple of episodes and that took so much time putting those two together and it just really got like a you know, I had kind of a range of expectations when you put something out, you're like, oh, you know, I mean, hopefully this will be like huge, you know, and people will really like it, but like at least hopefully, you know, it'll get, I don't know, a few thousand views, uh, in the first, uh, in the first couple of days. Um, and it, it really just like underperformed, I guess I would say. And, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, but, uh, but you know, the, the fact that it takes so much time and that it doesn't seem to do that much better than if I just wrote an article uh, makes me kind of want to refocus a little bit more on articles because, you know, between everything that I'm doing, I'm doing this podcast, I'm doing um, chess mix, I'm doing, I have news with Omnacronom, which is that I'm, I'm going to be basically recoding the game. I know that's totally nuts, but I'm going to be recoding Omnacronom in real time. And there's two advantages to that. Um, but, uh, we can get, we can talk about that another time. But the point is I'm, I'm doing a ton of different things. Um, and that's not even to mention like my day job stuff. I'm also finishing a, uh, uh, I'm finally getting a bachelor's degree uh, this semester. Uh, I have only a couple months left. I'm, so I'm writing a senior thesis, actually, a research project on uh, reactionary uh, politics and gamer culture. I'm um, talking about Gamergate and that kind of thing. Um, and that actually might inform slash turn into uh, morph into a new book that I might want to start writing at some point in the summer, this coming summer. So anyway, there's a bunch going on. Um, and of course, um, yeah, so so I've been struggling with the video thing. I'm going to be working more on articles going forward. Uh, that's going to feed into the Patreon and some of the things that I want to do. Um, getting the Patreon patrons a little more tied into that process. I want to do things like polls. You know, I want to get, I want to know what my patrons want to hear more of and read more about and that kind of thing. Um, okay, before we get into the first major section of the show, I want to talk just a little bit quickly about what I've been playing, because I've actually been playing a lot of video games recently, uh, and board games too. Um, I guess the first one I'll start with is, um, I started playing Apex Legends, mostly for research. I just wanted to, you know, kind of be on top of like, what are people playing these days? And this is this big game that, um, I believe I've heard overtook Fortnite. It's the new first person shooter battle royale game. Um, and... Uh, so, and I mostly played it because of that and because, um, I have a housemate who likes FPSs and I really just wanted to play something with him. And so, um, we've been playing that together. Actually, I have two housemates and the three of us play on a team together and that's really nice and fun. And, um, so from a social perspective, it's, it's great as a game. Um, and now this is my first experience actually playing one of these battle Royale games. I had not played player unknowns, battlegrounds or, um, Fortnite. Um, I played Fortnite for like two seconds and I, I've researched them a little bit, but I've never actually really dived into any of them. And uh, Apex Legends is, my opinion of it is, it's fine. <laughs> you know, it's an FPS. It is what it is. Um, I, I think I understand why the Battle Royale thing is appealing. Um, I, I get it and I, I also like it. I think that um, there's something intriguing. It's just basically a... Um, I think somebody on my discord mentioned that it was, they, they thought of it as just, you know, a bigger, um, a bigger payout and a bigger, um, like a less, less of a chance, you know, 
I've thought for a long time that online multiplayer games are kind of like a pulling of the lever when you get your opponent. You're, you're kind of just hoping that your opponent's going to suck so that you can just trounce them. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even mean that consciously. I just mean like subconsciously. We're always like sort of hoping that, oh, this person, I'm greatly outmatched against this person or vice, you know, the opposite of outmatched. I'm, I'm out, out, outmatching this person. I think that um, Battle Royale creates this situation where there's a lot... You you actually... So in this game, there's 60 players, uh, 20 teams of three each. So you have, as a player, I think about 5% chance to win, like one out of 20. Uh, as, you know, as opposed to like a one-on-one chess match where if you don't know who you're playing against, you have a 50% chance of winning. I suppose that might be a little bit off given that one side in chess has a slight advantage, but... You know, my, you get my point. It's around 50%. And in uh, the baseline in a Battle Royale with 60 players is 5% win. So it's really, really rare that you would actually win. And I think that there's a lot going on. I know there's these things like this kill leader system where um, somebody has the most kills in the game. And, you know, and then there's there's random loot. There's some th- some things I really like about these systems. You know, I really like the random loot. That's really cool. Um, that's like from roguelikes, and it seems um, it's not balanced, like as in like it's not uniform randomness, but it's you know it's not it's also like not a huge disparity. It doesn't seem like to me like you know anybody can get a kill with like pistols or whatever. You also get some indicators on the map of where the highest tier loot is. So there's a risk reward element. You know, I mean, it's not something I would take very seriously from a strategy game design perspective, but it's also an FPS. And so that's the fact that you, you know, the game is decided by who clicked on heads better is uh, is also a disqualifying element of those games. So as a strat- as strategy games. So but you got to look at them as their own things, which are kind of like, you know, these sport like contest uh, strategy games. And so from that perspective, Apex Legends, like I said, it's just fine. Um, a couple of notable things. One, I think the representation in the game is really fantastic. Um, there's a lot of people of color and there's, I think, um, two LGBT LGBT. There's like two, I think, LGBT characters. The art seems fine, and um, actually I saw some of the character paintings, and they're way better and more classy than those in League of Legends. Not that that's anything of a bar, but uh, the, you know, for an online competitive game, a lot of the times the, uh, the, the taste level can be quite low. And so I would say that Apex Legends is above average for that, for sure. And other than that, like, you know, people have talked about how, like, the guns, like, sound good and feel good to use. I would agree with that. You know, that's the kind of thing that I was really all about back in the day because, like, Doom and Quake and uh, stuff set the set the standard for those things. And I was very critical of things that didn't have good gun play. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, this seems good on that. So, yeah, it's it's fine. I wish I understood a little bit better, like, what... You know, because there's these the the concentric rings that are shrinking and getting smaller, and that works, and that works fine just to like you know amp up the fight and make sure everyone's fighting each other. But I feel like there's there's a potential there for a strategy kind of thing to be happening with that, and I don't think it is happening. But it's something interesting to think about. Um, so yeah, that's Apex Legends. Um, I'm of course quite terrible at it at it right now because. A, I haven't been playing FPSs for a while. B, I don't know any of the weapons. I don't know the maps. I don't know the character abilities, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm kind of just going in there and getting killed over and over again. But it's still cool. Um, okay, so the other thing I'm playing, obviously, is League of Legends. We're going to get into that soon and, and why that is. Um, but I will just quickly say, like, the, the game now is better than it's ever been. And uh, I definitely recommend, if you haven't checked it out in four or five years, to dive back in. In other news, I've been playing board games. I've been playing Race for the Galaxy now for like uh, forever. I'm just always going to play Race for the Galaxy as long as I live, I think. It's a fantastic game. The Keldon app and the Android app, which is this, uses the same AI, is phenomenal. I super recommend it. Check it out. It's just like one of the best Euro board games ever. I also played um, Scythe finally. I've had Scythe for about a year, but I never got around to sitting down, reading the rules, and actually playing. Um, I was lucky enough to have a friend who uh, who knew how to um, 
who knew had played before and so was able to explain the rules to me actually that was nick from dino farm so we played scythe um on my first learning game it seemed pretty cool then i also got it on steam which i didn't realize it was on steam but apparently it is the app seems pretty solid and uh, i played a couple matches there my opinion definitely has gone down a little bit some of the people on the discord are very um kind of like negative about scythe and i can see why actually it, it does you know one of the problems is uh, you have all these players like usually three or four players i guess or two to four players but in my games it was uh it was always three players anyway um and they don't interact with each other early on um like at all actually they're completely separated from each other um more so than in any euro game i've ever played um like it's total multiplayer solitaire for the first i don't know how many turns uh 20 30 turns maybe it could be all game if players don't decide to finally go at each other um but at some point players start you know bringing their mechs over into each other's um areas and so the way that one uh, uh person described it to me is that it, you know the first half is just this euro game and then it becomes just this war game and um you know, I can see the argument that it's kind of like these two games and neither of them are particularly good, particularly good versions of that game. So like, yeah, it's not the best Euro game and then it's certainly not the best war game. Um, and so I can see why it is kind of a problem. And I also think that, um, you know, the production values for Scythe are fantastic. And that's something that I always all does kind of make me a little bit concerned like um is that the thing that people like about this um it is suspiciously high on the um board game geek rankings in my opinion and uh you know i mean there's a lot to like about it um there's some really cool systems there's this one the upgrade system you have these four actions and um you can like move this cube from one area to another which you know, upgrades one of your top actions and upgrades one of your bottom actions. And it's this like really smart little system. Um, but yeah, it, it is kind of, it's kind of weird. It doesn't feel super developed or super, I don't know. It doesn't have the, like the kind of stroke of genius -y sort of feeling that some of these Euro games that I play um, certainly do have. So I'll keep playing that sort of cautiously. I'm not super terribly optimistic about it, but it's a thing and I'm I'm playing a game. Hey, how about that? And then also I played recently. So now I've been working on this game, um, uh, a, a traitor card game for uh, over a year now. It's going, it's going really, really well. Uh, but I have a new theme that I'm working on for it. Um, and the, anyway, this, I bought this game, um, elevens is for, it's a small, cheap little, you know, $13 board game. Um, a card game really and it's about tea time and i really like the theme but uh it it actually turned out uh to be pretty like shockingly shallow but then also weirdly long for how shallow it was and overall it just felt like one of these games that just really needed another couple passes uh design wise um and and the theme was also kind of like lazy and and haphazard it just felt like the whole game was made in a few months and really just needed to be cooked a little bit more um and it's a real shame because i love these like you know tea time kind of themes like these non-violent non um kind of like i don't know locker room uh sort of themes and um so yeah you know i i, I don't recommend elevens sadly um but i did play it and so uh that's that's that all right, so anyways, I've talked enough about all this stuff. Let's move into our first major section of the show, which is about League of Legends. Okay, so maybe you used to play League of Legends. Maybe you've never played it. Um, maybe you still play occasionally. Maybe you hate the game. Uh, perhaps you love it. Um, in any of these cases... I think if you're the kind of person who listens to this show, um, it's worth going back to League um, and and trying to dive into it. 
it's it's a really hard game to start. You kind of I feel like you need to have like a friend who knows how to play um, to like sort of walk you through stuff. I did. And that was helpful. But I mean, obviously, millions of people figure it out and figure out how to play. You don't have to play League of Legends, but I do think that designers who you know are serious about game design and and strategy games if they don't at least take League of Legends seriously, like I, I know some game designers or game design writers or people who are just, you know, embedded in the world of game design and interested in these kind of the kinds of stuff we talk about on this show. And I know a few people that are like that, but are completely dismissive of League of Legends and have no I They don't understand why I always talk, talk it up so much. And so today, that's what I want to kind of try to do is help illuminate that a little bit. Um, I mean, to start with. One of the main reasons I like League of Legends so much is that everything else is worse, <laughs> is that everything else is even worse. And, um, you know, and I can't uh, I can't say that for every single game. I mean, perhaps please show me something. But but, you know, League is in a very unique situation. There's never before in the history of mankind <laughs> been a, a game that had this much that, first of all, had had this good of a starting position as a strategy game and by that i just mean it's a moba game it's a game that has the you know the lanes and the minions and the structure that something like a starcraft an rts a fighting game an fps a racing game or you know whatever else just doesn't have so it has this really good starting position but then it has and, and that i would give that to dota 2 and and um heroes of the storm and you know any other games like that but then League of Legends has this, um, not only does it have, you know, like the, the f- what, the almost 10 year before it came out, um, development of the original Dota behind it to learn from, but then it itself is also, you know, now almost 10 years old. And not only that, but it became the most popular game of all time, like uh, at least strategy game. I forget the statistics uh, specifically, but it's it's, you know, if it's not still the most popular game in the world, it's like in the top three or four. The point is, and, and it's not, you know, that's what I mean. It's like we always have like a new most popular game of all time or of the year or whatever. But League has been like the most popular game for years and years and by a large margin. So my point is that like it has had this opportunity to like get metrics about play and to like you know process things in a way that no company has ever been able to do before with the strategy game. There's never been a game that was anywhere near this big that was a strategy game. And not just this big, but also there's something about the the Riot culture and believe me, there are very many bad things to say about the Riot culture, but there's also, you know, they're kind of a young company. They're like techie. They have a lot of really smart people that work there. I've been lucky enough to meet a number of them. Um, that's, by the way, another reason that you should go to these conventions. They have a lot of really, really smart, extremely talented people working there on these problems and uh, these design problems. And not only that, but they have a culture of, you know, I mean, the League of Legends patch notes are legendary. There's nothing I've never seen a company. Every time they have a patch, they put out a huge detailed patch note, uh, you know, page, web page that has detailed descriptions of everything that they've changed. And then they talk about why for like every change, pretty much, especially the big uh, significant things. They they have an explanation behind everything they do. Um, you know, I used to love like Blizzard patch notes. I, I It's funny. I'm now going back and looking at even new Blizzard patch notes. I, I look at their patch notes now and they're just like they're pathetic compared to League of Legends. And, you know, I, I think that that um, I think that's significant, not only for the players who get to engage on a deeper level with these changes because they understand what the motivation is behind them. But it also creates a culture within, I think, within um, Riot of, hey, let's let's actually like really hash out why we're changing things in the ways that we're changing things and be able to have a com- you know a conversation, not just with our own team privately, but also with the world about why about, you know, whether this item or this spell or this character is too strong or too weak or too, you know, narrow, whatever. <coughs> So it's that combination of they have like infinite resources combined with 
um, this special culture of, you know, it's not just that they make the patch notes. They make a podcast episode where they talk about it with pros. They make a video where they talk about it. Um, it's just like they take it so seriously. Um, and of course, if you missed it, I had uh, Greg Street, the lead designer of League of Legends on this podcast. So I would rewind back to then. Um, maybe I'll do a, I, in case you missed it and repost that at some point. I noticed some podcasts do that. They like repost old conversations that they've had a couple of years ago. And I think that's a pretty good idea. I should try that sometime. But anyway, I digress. You should check out that in- interview with Greg Street, where he talked a lot about the process there um, at Riot. And, you know, speaking of Greg Street, I the reason I got him on the show was I heard him in a video talking about um, these the new uh, dragons in the game, which are a new source. So one thing they've added to League of Legends is randomizing the map a little bit in terms of these dragons, which are um, basically objectives that you can clear in order to get certain bonuses. And in terms of uh, these new things called jungle plants, there's three different types of jungle plants. One of them, uh, you hit it and it like boops everybody, like bumps everyone outwards, bounces them out from the the, the plant. One of them creates like a big line of vision. It's like a little scanner, basically. And the third one drops a bunch of um, health, uh, health packs, basically, and slows you down as you munch them. And these are randomly um, being created throughout the map. And that um, helps to break up uh, some of this stuff. And in the video where Greg Street was talking about that, he used the expression input randomness as opposed to output randomness. And he talked about how, you know, so for example, in the dragon pit, uh, they, so like, let's say you kill the dragon. You want to know what the next dragon is going to be. An icon appears in the dragon pit showing what the next dragon that's going to be coming will be. And that's a great example of input randomness and the info horizon. And, you know, so uh, it turns out, you know, I talked to Greg and they were aware of my theory about uh, about uh, that, that those kinds of things like input randomness. And, uh, you know, if they know about that, I mean, that, that shows a attunedness to theory theory work out there they're they're curious they want to like know more about this stuff they're not just um kind of like making stuff you know or or seeing it as just like some sort of tech job but they they are actually interested in the discipline of game design and and you know that shows in other ways too the way that they rework their characters the way that they will just completely change things delete whole features um that's all stuff i've talked about before so um, I also have some, you know, obviously the, the amount of negative things you can say about League of Legends is massive and it's very easy to attack it. And I will, I will do so in a few moments. But first, I also wanted to just talk about why MOBAs, you know, the Dota likes, which is a name I prefer, um, are superior to other online strategy games, video games. The biggest one is just they're structured. Um, you know, Starcraft is really just a big empty map. The only structure, I mean, obviously there's geometry to the map. Um, and there's, uh, like, you know, expansion, there's minerals here and there, whatever, but there isn't a lot going on on most of the map in Starcraft. And I, I've always felt that I've always felt like, man, there's like this corner over here and like nothing's happening over there. And in fact, it's, it's weird. If you like go like bring an SCV out some to some weird spot and like build a barracks up there, it's always felt strange to me that you can do that. That feels like this, this thing that shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do, <laughs> you know, because it's like so rare and like, what are they supposed to scout that? Like, or, if they don't scout that, then like they're actually going to be getting punished for not doing that. That's just strange. And that points to this general lack of structure. And the other thing of it is, um, you know, in Starcraft, it's about producing a bunch of units, destroying the other units. Um, so, it, you know, I've talked about stuff like D&D boxing or, you know, just a bunch of actors killing each other in a box. And I think that Starcraft is kind of closer to that than the MOBAs are. And I would say the same thing about Civilization and, you know, 4X games. Um, most strategy games that I can think of are pretty unstructured, pretty loose. 
you kind of have this like just loose sandbox situation and then they just kind of like slap a goal on top of this like general sandbox whereas in league of legends or other moba games you have the three lanes you have the minion waves constantly interacting with each other being pushed forward and backwards you have the towers um you have things like the objectives you have and league um another uh i think great thing about it is that it has roles so there's not just uh five you know characters running around with their own special powers but there's like pretty formalized roles that characters play um support it being one of the most like pointed and clear ones uh but you have a jungler someone who goes through the jungle clearing out the jungle camps you have uh someone who's like a top who has to be kind of sturdy enough usually to survive out there on their own you have someone mid is a short lane so you usually put your like super bursty damage person there because they don't have to retreat very much if they uh if they're getting into trouble um and then you have your like marksman your person who just can lay down damage consistently and they uh get the bottom lane and they go with their support because uh there's uh what's it called there's uh it's a long lane so they wouldn't really be able to survive by themselves or or it would be very risky for them to be out there by themselves and then they have they've added these things called like support items so supports have their own specific way of getting gold and yeah the whole thing is just like really kind of like streamlined and and built and designed and system systemically interactive and uh so so they've done a lot with that but also just fundamentally the the moba games have a lot of the structure going on for them that is not there in other kinds of games uh certainly not in fps's um and then the other big thing about moba games is that they really put a pretty harsh cap on execution in terms of um you know like what you would expect in a video game, an online multiplayer video game, they have way less execution than you would uh, think. Um, so StarCraft certainly has more execution. You can like micro every single Marine. You got to keep building things in your base while you're like fighting and, you know, having like a little harassment force over here. And it's just, it's nuts the amount of execution and like just places your attention has to be in StarCraft at all times is extremely high. Uh, that's obviously the execution in first person shooters. It's it's just all about that. If you can place your cursor consistently over enemy heads, you win. Period. I don't care what your strategy is otherwise. All you gotta do is just, you know, and and, and one counter argument to this would be like, oh yeah, well, you know, everyone is kind of like making errors, and uh so you can kind of like assume that people hit their targets, I don't know. 40 50 percent of the time or something i don't know what the odds are but it's something around there maybe and then you just like factor that in and like a that's super random that that means your game is incredibly random but b um it still is going to come down it's this this is randomness you know your execution that's not uniform at all so like one team on a given match could just make just connect with their hits more than the other team this time around they win, you know? Um, and of course, I'm not saying that there's no skill to this. Like some people are, of course, legitimately much better at hitting their targets. But my problem is that as strategy games, those players, you know, whoever has more of those players, the better players who can just put the reticle over a human head more consistently are going to win. Um, this is certainly the case in uh, in 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 most you know, another thing that distorts this um, this issue is that um, a lot of times people will talk about this and they're like, they'll, they're like I'm hearing people counter argue with me in my head right now, and they'll say like, well, at the pro level, blah blah blah, everybody is like the same, or you know, it's it's really not about execution at the pro level. I don't care what happens at the pro level. I'm not going to play at the pro level. You listening at the home are not going to play at the pro level. The vast vast majority of players aren't going to play at the pro level. I do think there's some narrow situations where you want to think about what would happen at the pro level for your games. But for the most part, you want to think about like what what are most people's experience with this going to be? And, 
you know, for me, if I were to go play Counter-Strike or something, the best way for me to improve as a player is simply to get better at aiming. Uh, and if I do that, I will win more. And, you know, also when I go on and I play a match, you know, I, I might be making strategic calls like, oh, let's go to this play, let's go this way, but whatever. But ultimately, all that stuff is going to be getting overridden in, you know, in a context in which I would be playing by who just shoots heads better. Anyways, so that's another thing about the MOBA games is that they they really, really have a lot less execution than almost any online multi maybe any ulti online multiplayer uh video game that i can think of um of course turn-based games have less uh execution uh you know like something like playing civ online or or obviously or like chess or something but a there's not a lot of really popular online multiplayer uh competitive strategy games that are turn-based to me it's like there's there's no comparison there's no like turn-based version of league if there were I'd, I'd love to see it and play it and then finally the other thing that's kind of cool about um uh moba games particularly league of legends and actually maybe you could give this even more to dota i'm not sure um i forget if the map in dota is bigger than summoner's rift the main map in league i know that Har um heroes of the storm is smaller and so this applies less to heroes of the storm um and it's actually one of my main complaints about heroes of the storm but one of the best things about league is that there is it takes time to traverse the map and this is another way that it's kind of structured is that uh, you if you want to move from, let's say, bot lane to mid lane, that's going to take you, you know, 20 seconds or so, so a decent amount of time. And the cool thing about that, not just that, but like when you go back to base and you have to walk back to your position, there's all these opportunities in the game for you to actually sit and think about something, not not like think, like calculate you know, uh, and, and, and come up with the right answer, but to, um, consider and strategize and to imagine and to be creative. And it gives you that space to do that. And that's something that's super not in Starcraft. Starcraft absolutely does not give you just like a minute to just breathe and just like be a person and, you know, um, kind of like do something. You know, uh, that's one of the reasons that um, I've always liked turn-based games better than real-time games is, you know, it's not so much that it avoids things like execution, but it's just that it it lets me, <laughs> lets me like be, you know? Uh, it lets me like think and, and express myself and like, what do I want to do here? You know, and it's not about sitting there calculating and finding a superior answer by just, you know, going through some decision tree. I mean, there's a little bit of that, sure, but it's more about just you know, giving you a person some, some room to breathe. And I also think that, um, this is, this is good for a number of reasons. Um, but th this is, you know, I, to me, what league of legends is about is not about the, certainly not about stuff like last hitting and it's not about the team fights. It's, it's a little bit about the tactics. I mean, there are kind of actually cool tactical things you can do with certainly, particularly with some characters. Um, but it's more about when I'm like walking to lane, like sometime mid game, and I'm thinking about the options and the options are like, OK, I could like push this lane out. Oh, I see that guy's in my jungle. I could go try to get him. I could go ward dragon or like try to get my team to go take dragon. Maybe I could push mid. Maybe I could take this mid tower. You know, like there's all these different things that you could go and do. And as you're walking back to your position, you consider those things and you think about those things. And then sometimes you make a choice and you're like, okay, I think I'm going to go this way. But it's not like, it's not like in Starcraft where, you know, you're just constantly under the gun and there, it feels like there's a little more room to kind of like, uh, try things and to make mistakes too. I mean, that's, that's also important. That also, the fact that it's big and there's a lot of space also means that, you know, little mistakes and little changes in what you do and how you do it um, isn't so game-breaking or making, um, and that's another factor. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much more time on League. Um, I do have to mention some of the bad things, and I want to talk about some of the, you know, there's all kinds of bad things. Uh, some of the obvious ones are there's too many characters. I think there's over 160 characters at this point. It's just ridiculous. They need to stop making new characters and just remake 
you know, like redesign their old characters, some of whom are still kind of like, still kind of like just boring characters. Um, and, you know, it's okay to have simple characters, but there's a way that you can do simple, but like still functionally interesting. And then there's some characters who are just like, um, actually, there's not that many left, to be honest with you. Like there's, there's very few characters that I'm like, this character is so boring and and dumb that like uh they it's a problem in the game. There's a couple that are like borderline. Um Udir comes to mind for me. I also think Nasus probably could use a re a redo if anyone plays and knows the game. So there's stuff like that. Um too much content. Uh actually in I in terms of too much content though, it's pretty much only uh in terms of characters. I mean, I guess you could say skins are kind of some of the skins are a little bit confusing, like it's not super clear who a character is. And uh that that's definitely a problem. That just makes things harder for people. I think uh an option to turn skins off is something they would never do, but would actually be great. Uh you know, just so that um you like can always easily identify who characters are because it's already hard enough with 160 of them. Um, another kind of easy one is like last hitting. Um, I think even riot acknowledges that, um, that last hitting is bad. It's just that, um, last hitting, by the way, if you're not sure what that is, is, you know, you get most of your gold in the game from killing minions, but in order to get the gold out of a minion, you have to actually deliver the killing blow on it. Then this is called last hitting. And it sounds like that would be easy, but in the context of a game, uh, when things are happening, you're getting like poked by the other players. You have to keep your eye on, you know, whether you're going to get ganked or all kinds of different things. Um, it's, uh, it's actually not easy to last hit, uh, like certainly perfectly, but also like even very well, it's, it's really hard to last hit. But that's not my problem with it. My problem is it, with it is that it's just this skill that's completely separate from the rest of the game. It's like the old bake cake, uh, cake baking thing where like uh, you, you know, every time you want to capture a piece in chess or something, you have to bake a cake. And if the cake is good, then you capture the piece or or you win the match if the cake was good after you played chess. Things like that, where, where it's just this like separate system that you have to, you can just drill on your own and it's pretty disconnected from the rest of the game. And that's what last hitting is. So it needs to go. I agree. However, you can't just take it out. You have to replace it with something. And I do agree uh, that um, that's a not trivial thing to do. I actually wouldn't put it past uh, Riot to to actually try to address that at some point. Um especially if the game continues being popular through this year and next year, I could see them actually like being like, Hey, maybe let's address this. Let's do something about this because it's, um, it is really a problem. I don't think anybody likes it. And, uh, except perhaps for people who have grinded it out so that they're like incredibly good at it. Um, and you know, I mean, honestly, like, that that's too bad, but, uh, yeah, we should, we should do something better. I've thought of a few different ideas for how that could be better. One could be just that when minions die, they drop the gold and it only stays there for, I don't know, uh, like 10 seconds or something, five seconds. And you need to just like walk in and grab the gold. Um, if both players are doing that, I think that that provides opportunities for, uh, you know, it's super intuitive, number one. And number two, it's like provides opportunities for, all kinds of stuff. But anyway, there's there are problems with that. That's going to screw up a lot of stuff. And so you can't just do that. You're going to have to change all kinds of stuff in order to make that work or something like that work. But the point is they should do something about that because last hitting is bad. But also you can't just take last hitting out because it is something that the, the game is depending on to function right now. Although I sometimes wonder though, like if they just legit took last hitting out, like you literally just like turned it off. And so like minions now... Either they always give full gold when you're around and they die, or they never give gold at all. I guess to them, never giving gold at all would probably be a problem. But let's say they just like, it works like experience. If you're around a minion when it dies, you get the gold and the experience, period. Um, I guess that makes experience and gold like one to one. So that's kind of like a weird thing. But, you know, I still think the game would work okay. I don't know. Anyways, uh, I know there's some characters who are like specifically good at or better and worse with that. And it would change the balance a little bit, but like, I think it would still probably work. I don't know. Argue with me about this if you want. But the, the 
Probably the most perplexing problem with League that they have not seemed to make any headway on at all, as far as I can tell, is the issue of the representation of women in that game. And actually the represent, uh, like the representation, race representation, um, actually just representation in general in that game is just like, it's really dreadful. I think there's like less than five characters of color. Maybe there's five, but like it's overwhelmingly a white cast and this is 160 characters and you have like, you know, certainly no more than like eight or nine characters of color i don't think uh but i think i as far as i can remember i can think of like maybe three or four characters of color that are in the game and uh that's kind of a problem um also a vast there's there's a lot of female characters but they all have this almost like 90 percent of them have the exact same body type and i think we all know which body type that is and then they all they also all have like the same face they all have this same like i don't know what that face where that face came from but it's i guess it's like comic book but it's like this same white lady white girl face uh and it's really it's kind of creepy actually when you see them all lined up together like in the loading screen um it's extremely like you know male gazy uh and it's just weird to me that in 2019 they're not they don't seem to be trying to change this at all like they're putting out new skins now um and they're it's like the same as ever it's like they're acting like and you know it's the reason i'm surprised too is because riot has been having a lot of um like internal um and you know public uh um scandals about like you know that they're kind of a sexist environment uh work environment uh there was a kotaku expose that came out and then there's another one that came out and you know i i've known people that have worked at riot and i've heard exactly that kind of stuff um and so it's shocking to me that they haven't done a better job of improving this but i guess it probably shouldn't be shocking to me um but in another way, it should be shocking to me because I should expect that people should, you know, like try to do better. I understand like screwing this up in the first place. We all come out of this culture where certain things are normalized. Um, you know, my first game, 100 Rogues, had some of that kind of stuff in it. Um, not really, but I mean, like, you know, we had like like uh, like bouncy boob animations and like uh, things like that, which are unfortunately very normalized in like animator culture and you know comic book culture and video game culture and i think that's been just recently you know in the last five years or so people have started to like be like oh maybe that's kind of maybe that's kind of othering for people you know who aren't uh straight uh, you know men and um so i think that that's good that we're all talking about that but i'm sort of perplexed that riot has not uh kind of been keeping up on that front or on the racial representation front um but you know um there's so much that's toxic about the theme and everything of league of legends anyway that it's like it's kind of like you know what am i like it's already just terrible it's everything is like this serial killer chic you know, every, everyone's like constantly talking about like murdering each other and how much they love to kill. And uh, it's just it's 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 very it's a very gross place to be thematically. And so, you know, that's something I've had to like get used to. And, uh, you know, stuff like the pentakill being so lauded. Um, it's just yeah, it's just kind of a gross place to be. Um, but uh a lot of that stuff you can factor out um and actually you know the male gazy stuff i had also been factoring out but or you know just trying to like not see <laughs> but sometimes i'm looking at that loading screen and i'm like this just looks like a bunch of like pinup babes you know um why are these the characters in this game um and they're all like that and it's really kind of uh, strange anyways so we will uh move on now I, uh, this is my pitch for League of Legends. Don't, don't think too much about the bad stuff. I mean, that I can come up with just as bad stuff for almost any popular video game. Um, I do think League is a very special thing that has very special qualities. There's nothing else like it uh, for the reasons that I stated. And I do hope you'll try to give it another shot at some point. Uh, or at least look it up 
read about what they've been doing, watch some videos of theirs, etc. Uh, okay, so without any more on League, I will now move on to our final section of the show. Okay, so you're an indie game developer like me, and here's a really cool thing that you can do. You can just make the whole game yourself. Uh, even if you're not particularly great at programming or particularly great at art or particularly great at game design or writing or, or music or any of the things that are required, as long as you can like get over a certain threshold with all these things, you can just make your own games. And that, that is earnestly an awesome thing. That is fantastic. I spent a good 20 years of my game development, um, not career, but like life, I guess you would say, um, being a artist, a musician, a game designer with game design as my primary passion, but not a programmer and always trying to fight to get someone to help me make a game, to program a game for me. Um, and, uh, and I, and sometimes I would find that sometimes I wouldn't <coughs> 100 rogues was made that way. Oro was mostly made that way until the very, very end. I started hopping into the code at the end. Um, Empire was made that way. Um, the first game that I put out where I was the I started out coding it on my own was Escape the Omnocrodom. Um, and so since then, that was about 2015 that I started that, believe it or not. And it's went through all kinds of different revisions and different versions since then. But um you know, I've, I've learned a little bit about what it's like to be a designer who isn't working with a programmer versus being a designer who is. And there's a real difference. And, I, you know, at some point throughout Omnocronom, I, um, I started paying a coder to help me make the game. And so I got that experience. And now with Dino Farm, uh, we have a programmer. I'm not touching the code because I'm too terrible. And the programmer's just like, it's honestly going to be just easier if I just do it, which is super legit. And that's totally fine. In fact, I, I like it um, because of this issue of this specific pitfall of being both the designer and the programmer on a game. So, and it's a unique relationship because, you know, you, being the designer and the artist has some of those problems. Being the artist and the programmer probably is a little bit similar. But the, the thing is, like, being the designer and the programmer, like, you know, the design, the systems designer is someone who is like fundamentally interacting with the code and the way that the code operates um, in a way that the artist is not, that the musician is not, um, that other people involved in the team are not. And uh, I've had a lot of trouble actually um, being in that role of being the uh, designer and the coder. Now, part of this could be that I'm, I'm not a great programmer. Um, and so programming takes a lot of, you know, energy for me. Um, and it takes me a lot of time to do stuff. I kind of brute force things a lot because I know there's some smarter way to do stuff. I just, I don't know. I don't have that many tools as a programmer. I'm not really a programmer. I'm like, I've kind of like, I'm like self-taught ish. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I sort of think of it more as like, I don't know programming. I just know unity. Um, and so I have to like brute force things. And so it's a lot of effort and energy and just work, uh, to get something working. And so then like the problem so what problem one is if I want to change something, it's like, I kind of just have to like redo a lot of stuff. And it's hard even to do that because stuff is so messy that like, you know, it's hard to delete large chunks of code or like rewrite stuff because things are not like properly organized into their own classes and whatever folders and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so that makes reprogramming hard, which is discourages me from redesigning a little bit. And then also there's just this matter of just you're splitting your mental energy and your mental resources between these two things it's like oh i could i could spend you know and and programming feels so productive like you know you can get in there you can implement a bunch of fe features check a bunch of boxes off the trello um fix a bunch of bugs make a new build send it out to your testers and you're like ha new version here we go you know it feels really good because you actually can see linear progress 
Game design, on the other hand, is like, okay, what, <laughs> you know, it's like doing philosophy or something. It's, it's like, what, what do I want this to be? You know, what should this be? What would be fun? What would be good? What do I want? What's in my heart, you know? And not just what do I want, what's in my heart, but like how on earth do I go about achieving that in this system and this constant doubt of feeling like maybe there isn't something here. Maybe I can't do, you know, maybe I can't make this into something that I would love that that expresses something that I, I want to express. And so it's, you know, the 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 pressures on you in both directions are very different and so what i find happens for me a lot of the time is i just code i just code 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 sometimes while i'm coding i'll like kind of improvise a design change here and there but that's like that's kind of like the worst way to design you know uh the best way to design for me anyway um is um well i shouldn't say it's the best way to design but a very important way for me to to make stuff good is to enter what I call design cave where I clear everything else off my mind and I just kind of like sit and think about the game design for a long time. I just think about like, okay, so I want plank. I want like, I don't know, longer arcs or I want uh, there to be some, you know, just a strategic decision about like which resource to go for or like some kind of trade off, some kind of like, you know, a double edged sword type of thing. And so I just sit there and I think about like, well, what would, how would this work? How would that work? And I, I'm kind of like prototyping in my mind really fast and trying stuff out and, and, you know, thinking about different possibilities. And this can take, you know, like hours. Um, and I like to believe that like my brain is working on it in the background while I'm just out in the world doing whatever I do. Um, and I'm sure it is to some extent, but a lot of times you just got to sit down and just think about it. And you know, the annoying thing is that sometimes you do that and nothing comes of it. You don't have this new build to send out to your testers with a bunch of linear progress made. Um, you have maybe a couple of like drawings or, you know, some, some stuff written down, like some ideas written down. And then, you know, like they don't even make sense really. And you just, you think about it for two more seconds. You're like, oh yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't work. You know, um, you, you like went down this long path of thought and, and it can feel like a waste of time, you know? Um, and so it's hard. And, and so having to make the choice of, am I doing programming today or, or game design today or, or like some kind of weird thing of both? It's hard for me to do both at the same time. And perhaps that's the right answer maybe is to like kind of bounce back and forth in some way. But, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what the answer to this is, but it's just something that I struggle with because, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking probably the answer is sometimes going to the game design cave, sometimes just program, sometimes do a little mix of both. And, you know, of course, obviously sometimes do none of the above and just step away and like, um, do other things. But I, I've been really seeing the downside of just in general, the arrangement of being the coder and the, uh, designer. Um, and I've really been like, man, I just, I, I, I can't wait to like, and I've been doing a little with uh, happy snake and I are making a game that's going pretty well, I think. And I'm just uh, on the design role there. Um, I have the same kinds of like, you know, doubts about like, Oh, is this going to work at all? But at least like every time I sit down, I know my job is, is to make good design calls, period. And that feels good. Like I, I, you know, and I do kind of get a little bit of like a, uh, it's nice working with someone else because like, you know, uh, snake is basically like, write me up a bunch of Trello tickets, you know, like, and I, so I write him a bunch of Trello to do's that are based on my design cave work. And so that I feel like I accomplished something, you know, kind of, um, whether I made a good calls is a, is a, you know, to be determined, but, uh, I did do something and that, that feels good. And then one more problem with, uh, being the coder and the designer is that like you, it's actually hard to go completely into the design cave. And the reason I call it the design cave is because I'm trying to get away from the things I know about the code base, you know? So like if I want to change, uh, something about chess mix right now, um, I know the code. I know the, the organization of it. I know how hard it would be to do X. I know how hard it would be to do Y. And, or like, you know, I have a loose sense at least. 
And so if I'm thinking about like possibilities for the game and what could make the game like feel good to play and be fun and all that kind of stuff, it's it's hard for me to do that and not think about the code and think about what would be hard to do and what would be easy to do. And I find that a lot of the time, you know, I I make design calls around code stuff. I'm like, okay, well, this thing is like kind of like what I wanted and it's and it's easier to do code wise. So let's just do that. And like I'll sort of tell myself like, oh, well, this is and this is for like prototyping and just see if it works, you know? But then it kind of just stays and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff. Um making games is hard, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. But um yeah, um, that's more or less what I had to say on the topic. Um, I'd love to hear if you have stories about being a coder, uh, working with a designer, being a designer, working with a coder, or being a person who is doing both jobs. Um, I would love to hear about your process and how do you do that? Like, what do you, how do you break things up so that you're not designing as a coder or, um, I guess coding as a designer, which would be like, you're making these like on the fly calls as you're coding or you know, um, yeah, I, I love if you have any thoughts about that. Anyway, that's about all I had for this uh, week. I shouldn't say this week for this episode of the Clockwork Game Design Podcast. Thank you for watching. And of course, if you like this show, please do consider supporting it on Patreon. Um, the Patreon's going really good. It's about to get even better. Um, and I would love to have you there, get your feedback, get your thoughts about, you know, how things are going. What do you want to see more of? What do you want to hear less of? That kind of stuff. So thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time.